In this video, we continue with the book titled Dynamic Thought by Henry Thomas Hamblin, published in 1923. It is in the public domain. I am going to share my narrator's comment. If you're eager to move on to the next chapter, please go to the description and click on the timestamp. It will take you there. If you're new to my channel, welcome, welcome. And to our fortune community, welcome back. Hopefully you're enjoying this new book. There were two key points that grabbed my attention from part three. One was the mention of macrocosm and microcosm as it was relating to the point on creativity. I don't know about you, but for me, I use a lot of nature to help me understand what I see in the world because to me, nature has not failed us yet. And it doesn't take a genius to see that you can open up your mind to seeing everything wide scale. And then you can begin to look at the smaller things, the life of an ant, and then go even smaller and look at the structure of the cells in our body and all the movement and all the things that they do. Sometimes when you look at the way that blood flows through our body, it's almost like a super highway with things moving one way, think others going the other way, osmosis happening here, things are dumping over there, things are coming in on another area. It's just amazing. So imagine the world of the body and then you keep going out, out, out. It's interesting if you've ever seen those videos where they show one little area and then the camera keeps pulling itself out, out until it's way above the earth and you could see the movement of the traffic and the air and it just begins to look like a whole living organism and we then turn out to be like the little cells in the body. It is crazy, the super highway of, of the, on the planet. Which brings me to the conclusion and I agree with the author that just as the infinite mind is absolute through the whole universe, then we too are kings of our life. We are creator of our life and our circumstances. Now, the second point that I thought was interesting, worthy to share with you, was when the author mentioned that nothing has ever been accomplished by man that has not first been created and imaged in his mind. And this is worthy of repeating and sitting down with this and contemplating on it and just really letting that sink in because the truth will set you free. Seriously, look around you. Look at anything, whether it's a door, a chair, a car, a building. Someone thought about that. Someone had that design in their mind. And yes, there was an energy that worked with the next step of making it a reality, attracting the right people, having the right skills, and everything else. But the point is, it comes first in the mind. And because it's in the mind, it does not make it not real. It's real to whoever is imagining in the world of the mind. And the more that we focus on something, the more we begin to project it out into the world. This is my belief. Here's an example. I'll tell you the color red as far as, hey, have you seen any red cars lately? All of a sudden now your mind is beginning to imagine red cars. And so you're heading over to the store or to the warehouse or to your favorite restaurant. And all of a sudden you see one red car a second red car, and there are all these red cars that are now visible to you. Before, you were oblivious to them. You weren't paying attention. It wasn't important. But now it was brought to your attention and you allowed it to rest in your mind and it just became a part of the conversation in your mind. And so it is with anything else. Think about anything that you ever wanted, whether you were an artist, a creator of some sort, whether it's you have a wood shop or some type of craft that you do, you picture it, you build up on it, and then you begin to get ideas on how to make this a reality. This also works with anything else and everything else. Many of us use this technique and we don't even realize. Could you imagine if we really would focus on the discipline of what we're thinking and the ability to cancel out the thoughts that do not align with our main theme? How much more powerful would we be? Here's an example. Many years ago when I was in the academy, I was getting ready to qualify for the 
firearms exam. Unfortunately, I did not have the strength in my hand, so I did not pass. One of the instructors said, Daisy, all you need to do is pretend you are squeezing a lemon. Well, that wasn't the only thing, <laughs> of course, but I also understood my weakness and I also had a desire to qualify and pass. So I saw myself aiming at the target and just seeing it with a bunch of holes on it in center mass. And I actually trained my arms, my hands specifically. And when I went to pass the exam, I did pretend I was squeezing a lemon and it was the most effortless thing. And I received my marksman certificate. So that's just one instance. I mean, I've had a very colorful life and there are many things that I have achieved through the sweat of my brow, but also on that aspect of the unseen realm, having faith that what I'm moving towards will meet me at some point in the future and just letting it go and just moving forward and living this moment. I'd love to hear your stories of things you've achieved, whether you think it's small or large, it doesn't matter. It's the same energy that we're working with, right? and the same process. Okay, let's move on now to part four. We now have to deal with that part of your mind, which is the center of all action and the seat of all memory. Not only the memory of this life, but the rare memory of all mankind. This division of the mind we will call the subconscious mind. We will do so in order to distinguish it from the mind of creation, intuition, and inspiration, which we have already considered, and also from the objective or conscious mind, which will be described later. The subdivision is not orthodox according to the ordinary teachings of psychology. The usual practice is to term the whole of the submerged mind subconscious. That this is not correct must if we think for a moment, be apparent. The subconscious mind acts only according to instruction and instinct. Thoughts and commands flow from the seat of the will through the conscious mind down into the subconscious mind and are immediately acted upon. The subconscious mind is a blind intelligence. It cannot reason. It can remember. It can act. But it cannot think, plan, or reason. Yet we have a mind within us that can inspire, create, and bring forth the most wonderful thoughts. A mind which can solve our most complicated problems, that can guide us through the most difficult situations if we will but trust it. This cannot be the subconscious mind because we have already seen that this is a blind intelligence acting only upon instruction. Suggestion and animal instinct. Therefore, there must be a mind or minds other than the subconscious, and this I have termed, for the want of a better word, the subliminal. The subconscious mind is a kind of a sleepy giant or a slumbering volcano. It only requires arousing to cause it to manifest extraordinary power. It is a vast and wonderful intelligence, so wonderful that our consciousness cannot form any conception of its wonders. All that we know is that this wonderful center of life and action is as far above our understanding as our own consciousness is beyond the comprehension of a beetle. Yet this subconscious mind of ours is subject to our will and guidance. Within us is this wondrous power, the almost infinite intelligence, yet its use and control are in our own hands. Unto us is given the ability to govern a power whose extent we cannot gauge, to direct an intelligence so great it is impossible for us to grasp its full significance. The subconscious mind is the center of all action. It is by this mind that everything that we do is accomplished. 
It is the personification of tireless energy. It works constantly. It never sleeps. For while we sleep, the subconscious mind is busily engaged in repairing and rebuilding the body. Whatever thought we allow to pass into the subconscious mind is translated into action. This is why a thought has been described as an action in the process of being born. The great lesson for you, dear reader, to learn is this, that if the subconscious mind translates each thought into action, then thought control is the one great transcendental fact of life. If you possess the power to control your thoughts, you have at once the power to control your actions. If you can control your actions, what a life of possibility opens before you. One of the principal causes of failure in life is due to inability to control the thoughts. Wrong thoughts reach the subconscious mind. These are translated into wrong actions and these bring failure and disaster in their train. When the thoughts are uncontrolled, then the subconscious mind will act upon any thought or suggestion that may float in. Now thoughts and suggestions are born not only within the consciousness, they're also received from without, like a wireless apparatus which receives messages through vibrations in the ether. So does the human mind receive impressions from without. Thoughts are things, are entities, have form and substance, and are eternal. Thoughts impinge upon your consciousness, and unless you are able to reject them, they will enter the subconscious mind and bring forth action in your life and conduct. If therefore the thought be evil, then evil will result. If of weakness, then failure will follow. You cannot prevent the action once you have entertained the thought. In the same way, if you entertain a noble thought, a noble action will result. If thoughts of success and power are dwelt upon, then success and power to accomplish will be manifested in your life and circumstances. It is thought that rules your life. Therefore, if you govern your thoughts, you control your life. Suggestion meets you at every turn. Kind friends, with the best of motives, suggest ill health to you when they remark on your pallor. Their well-meant remarks of how ill you look send a suggestion of sickness to your subconscious mind, which later manifests itself in real sickness in the body. Articles in your daily paper on diet, influenza, and other topics again suggest illness to you. Even the advertisement suggests that you have kidney disease or worse, and that to save your life, it is necessary for you to take certain tablets or pills. The newspapers themselves do their best to suggest evil to you. The columns are full of the seamy, sordid side of life. If any man commits a crime, it is reported in the papers. If, however, he resists temptation and instead does a good deed, no notice is taken. Therefore, newspapers give an entirely false presentation of life. The press closes its eyes to the good and presents the evil, and thus suggests evil to you, which if you do not watch it, will produce evil in your life. For every bad deed reported in the papers, a thousand good actions go unrecorded. The world is full of noble deeds and gracious thoughts, and they can be seen and realized by those who look for them. Therefore, be very careful what newspapers you read and how you read them. Avoid reading of the evil, seamy side of life. Instead, look for the good and you will find it. When reading your paper, devote your attention to the large things, those which will go down in history. Avoid that which is mean and petty. Thus will you avoid unwholesome and dangerous suggestion. Newspapers, periodicals, and some books would have you believe that life is an unlovely thing. Even some hymn writers have dared to describe the world as a veil of tears and life as 
a long drawn out woe. Do not believe these wicked suggestions. Life is a gracious and lovely thing. It is full of beauty and love and peace and happiness. Life is what we make it. We can make it sublime or we can make it savor of hell. It is in our own hands. Therefore, do not read either papers, books, or magazines that do not present life in a joyous and optimistic way. Avoid low-class scrappy reading. Read instead good books by great minds. Imbibe noble thoughts. Read good poetry if you can. Seek the beautiful, the noble, the true in your reading and in your fellow men, and you will find them and be richly blessed thereby. How then, you ask, can I escape all this harmful suggestion? I am conscious of evil in my life. I do not know what to expect next. How then can I cast out evil and avoid all these harmful suggestions that impinge upon my consciousness from a thousand different sources? The answer is by denials. First of all, I want you to understand that your life consists only of that which is in your mind. Your world also is really nothing more than a reflection of your own mind and what is in your own mind. It is because of this that two people in precisely the same circumstances will each find life and the world very different. One will see in life great joy and much cause for thankfulness, and the other may experience only unhappiness and disappointment. The difference is not in the circumstances, but in the mind. The mind is the real thing. The world is transient and fleeting and has, philosophically speaking, no real existence, but mind endures. The natural or mortal mind view of life and the world is almost always the exact opposite of what is the real spiritual truth and fact. Metaphysics tell us that the visible world is an inverted reflection of the real. If then it is inverted, it is natural until our spiritual or inner eyes are opened to the truth for us to see things as the exact opposite of what they really are. Therefore, it is not surprising to find that whereas the mortal or animal mind of the senses thinks the world is the real thing and the mind only a shadow, the real truth is that mind and spirit are real and eternal and the visible world but a transient and impermanent thing which has no actual reality. Such being the case then, the only thing that really matters is what is in the mind or what is not in the mind. If we have a belief in evil and thoughts of evil in our mind, then we have evil in our life. If, however, we can cast the thought of and belief in evil out of our mind, then it will cease to appear in our life. By raising ourselves above the sensuous life and realizing our permanent world of mind and there denying evil, poverty, failure, pain, sickness, unhappiness, or whatever our trouble may be, we kill the thought which is the cause of all our troubles. Then whatever we affirm will take their place. If we deny evil, then we follow by affirming good. If we deny sickness, then we affirm prosperity and affluence. By denials, we can take out all the evil, care, fear, and worry out of our lives and build up in their place by means of affirmations, perfect good, success, affluence, happiness, health, love, peace, and courage. Everything being in the mind, then everything that is taken out of the mind is taken out of the life, and everything that is put into the mind comes into the life. Thus, it is 
possible with mathematical accuracy and certainty to recreate the life, to cast out all the undesirable, and to build up in its place only the beautiful, the good, the true. Life is what we like to make it. We can make it like heaven itself, fall to the brim with all that is good and beautiful, or we can turn it into a perfect hell. Therefore, do not accept the suggestions of those who, having failed in life, proceed to call it hard names. We can make life a continual joy. We can create a heaven within us by the quality of our thinking and mental processes. All that we see in life, all that we experience, yeah, even life itself, is but the outward expression of the life within. The life within is built up by our thinking. You will have seen by this time the purpose and value of affirmations. Affirmations are concentrated thoughts. Back of each affirmation is a strong emotion, and this gives it tremendous driving force. Not only do affirmations impress the subconscious mind, thus producing action in accordance with the will, but they project outwards from the mind into space, attract forces and help from other sources and bring them to minister and to bless. Not only so, but they also arouse the subliminal mind to inspire, to create, to impart wisdom. By the use of affirmations, all the finer forces are aroused to action and the life is transformed from weakness or ineffectiveness to strength and purposefulness. By the use of affirmations, the will is strengthened until it becomes so strong all else has to bend to it. By the use of affirmations, the body is strengthened and made healthy and exercise and body culture becomes a pleasure instead of a duty. By the use of affirmations, difficult tasks and unpleasant duties become easy of accomplishment. By the use of affirmations, it is possible to break bad habits of a lifelong standing and replace them with good ones. By the use of affirmations, we can build up character, mold our circumstances, shape our destiny, captain our soul. We can be what we will, do whatever we desire, attain to all our ideals. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance that you should be most diligent in practicing the affirmations always. Never let a single night or morning pass without spending several minutes in quiet concentration on the affirmation given you in this course. Reading this course through will do but little good. It is doing what it teaches that is going to make you strong and successful. Mental and physical lethargy must be overcome. It is by sustained action that you can accomplish. You cannot dream yourself to success. You have to win it. Therefore, you must concentrate, concentrate, concentrate upon the affirmations and visualizing exercises. The latter are a form of affirmation and are of equal importance. A word of warning. Do not keep changing your affirmations. Do not affirm one thing one day and another the next. It causes confusion in your mental world and makes confusion worse confounded in your life. Of course, as you overcome weaknesses and bad habits, you will alter your affirmations accordingly. You will always find some defect that wants eradicating. Otherwise, keep to the affirmations given in these lessons. By this, I do not mean that you are not to make denials, reversions, and affirmations at all times adapted to all the varying circumstances and difficulties of life, because these are, for your own protection, necessary. Thus, if you see a sight 
that suggests evil to you, a drunken man, an act of hate, a quarrel, an act of immorality, or if you read that which is lowering and depressing and suggestive of lower things, then, for your own protection, you must reverse it. For instance, if you see an angry, violent man, if you do not reverse this, the suggestion of evil conveyed to you by this sight will sink into your subconscious mind and cause cells to vibrate into sympathy, thus making you more susceptible to anger thoughts, besides lowering the tone of your mind generally. Therefore, you must raise yourself to your perfect mental world and deny anger by saying, Man, being a perfect mental creature, can never be angry. There's no anger in this perfect world of mind. All is love and goodwill. By so doing, not only will you stop the suggestion of evil from harming you, you will also, at the same time, make yourself stronger than ever before, and, strange as it may seem to you now, you will reduce the anger in the mind of the angry man. The reason of this is that there is really only one mind. We are all inlets of the same sea, and if we cast evil out of our own mind, then we also make the world and the minds of others the better by doing so. Thus, by purifying himself does man become a savior of the world. These reversals of denials and affirmations made in your perfect world of mind must be taking place all day. It is in this way that every evil is transmuted into good, every difficulty into accomplishment, every threat of failure into success, and every pain or sickness or disease thought changed into perfect health. This must go on continually. Thus will you grow in power daily. But apart from this, you will doubtless have some plan towards which you are moving. You have some ambition to be realized, some creative purpose in your mind which you wish to accomplish. To attain to this end, you can deny failure, you can affirm success, you visualize a picture of that which you wish to achieve. That being so, and having made up your mind, now stick to it. Do not change your affirmation. Do not alter your mental image. Keep it unchanged until it is accomplished. If you vary it and change it, you will bring the utmost confusion into your life. Therefore, do not change, modify, or alter the main creative plan of your life. See to it that the image remains unimpaired, getting clearer and more sharply defined from day to day. If you do this, you will see it working out with mathematical precision in your life. This course has been prepared so as to guide students by a sure and safe path to the goal of their ambitions. It will guide you if you follow the lessons exactly. Therefore, while taking this course, do not read any other metaphysical literature. Concentrate on this teaching. Persevere with the doing of this teaching, and you will be able, like the writer, to prove and demonstrate its truth in your life and circumstances. I want you to start seriously to develop your visualizing powers. By this, you will improve your memory out of all knowledge, but that is quite a minor matter. What is of importance is that what you create in the form of a mental vision, if persistently held in the mind, will assuredly manifest itself in your life. Thus, you have two methods by which you can alter your life, create better circumstances, and achieve success. First, by denials and affirmations, and second, by meditation, concentration, and visualizing. The two should work together. For instance, you make an affirmation preceded by a denial. Next, you conjure up a mental picture of what you have affirmed yourself to be. You wish to be successful. Therefore, first of all, you must deny evil and affirm good. Because evil is the general cause of all your troubles and lack of success. Next, 
you will affirm success and follow this by visualizing either yourself in your perfect mental world, radiant and successful, or else dwell only on the perfect world of mind where there is no failure or limitation of any description. First, you clear away the mist of evil which clouds your vision and numbs your faculties and crowds your life with difficulty. This you do by killing it by the use of the denial. There is no evil. Use this denial until the mist clears away and you get a clear view of your perfect world of mind. Then affirm, there is only infinite good. Then deny poverty and failure because they have no part in a perfect world. Neither can they affect you who are in essence a perfect mental creature. Having killed failure and poverty by denial, then affirm, I am success. I am a perfect mental creature, one with the source of all good, part of the universal mind. I am success. Like a magnet, I attract to me all that I need. A thousand invisible forces hasten to do my bidding. I am carried along by an irresistible power. I am success, success, success. Make this affirmation preceded by the denials night and morning, always making the affirmation in your perfect mental world, Buttress it up by repeating it during the day, each time raising yourself to your higher world. Do this, and you will revolutionize your life. In order to increase your powers of mental imagery, do the following exercise. Take a simple flower or picture and gaze at it very attentively for several minutes. Examine it in every possible way. Impress every detail upon your mind, then close your eyes and call up an exact mental image of the thing you have been looking at. If the image is crisp and sharply defined with no details missing, you will have done well. If not, keep on trying until you succeed. When you go into a strange room or office, examine carefully every detail where each piece of furniture is what pictures are on the walls, what is on the floor, the kind of fireplace and everything else that forms part of the furnishing. After you get home or when in the train, close your eyes and recall by making a mental image as much as you can of what you saw. Practice this visualizing as much as possible during the coming week and make affirmations to suit your growing developments. Whatever your need may be, you can make a denial and affirmation to supply that need. Whatever difficulty you have to face, you can overcome it by denial and affirmation made in your perfect world of mind. This course seeks first to build a firm foundation of character upon which you can later erect the superstructure of success. Seek first to eradicate all weakness of character and in their place install their opposites. For instance, if you have been a procrastinator, become instead noted for your instant action. If you have been pessimistic, become cheerful and optimistic instead. If unpunctual, become the most punctual person who ever lived. If you have been sullen and morose, seek to be bright and cheerful. All this is possible and really quite easy of accomplishment by the use of denials, affirmations, and mental imagery. When you have built up your character, the road of success will become comparatively easy because success is principally a matter of character. The elementary general affirmation has now served its purpose and must now be strengthened. You have progressed sufficiently to join us in the greatest denial and affirmation of all, which is, there is no evil, only infinite good. It is very difficult for the beginner to realize that there is no evil. There are entities in your mind which prevent you from understanding this truth.
but they will be cast out by the denial. So powerful is this denial that it makes some people quite ill at first. But this only proves how great is the cleansing work that is going on in the depths of the mind. Keep on making the denial night and day. Keep looking up into your perfect world of mind and after time you will suddenly realize that for you there is no evil, only infinite perfection and everything that is beautiful and true. Proceed every other affirmation by this denial and affirmation. Before starting any important work, make use of them and previous to engaging in any meditation, always use them, raising at the same time your mind into its perfect world. By this means, you will so cleanse and strengthen your mind that you will transform your life. For meditation this week, think upon these words of James Allen. The soul that is impure, sordid and selfish is gravitating with unerring precision toward misfortune and catastrophe. The soul that is pure, unselfish and noble is gravitating with equal precision toward happiness and prosperity. Every soul attracts its own and nothing can come to it that does not belong to it. To realize this is to recognize the universality of divine law. And also upon these words of Buddha, All that we are is the result of what we have thought. It is founded on our thoughts. It is made up of our thoughts. And again, these further words of James Allen. Your own thoughts, desires, and aspirations comprise your world. And to you, all that there is in the universe of beauty and joy and bliss, or of ugliness and sorrow and pain, is contained within yourself. By your own thoughts, you make or mar your life, your world, your universe. Appendix. Referring to page 92 of this lesson, third paragraph from the bottom, it should be stated that quicker results will be obtained if, in addition to visualizing yourself radiantly successful, you will create a sharply defined picture of the exact success that you wish to achieve. If it is money that you want, then see the money falling in showers upon your desk. If it is service to others that you desire, then see yourself nursing the sick and ministering to the brokenhearted. Whatever you picture in this way, persistently, will in time be brought to pass in your life. Nothing ever happens. It is always brought to pass. You cannot get what you want merely by a pious wish. You have to work for it by mental imagery. Then in time, the way will open up for you in a most marvelous manner. Continue to practice concentration on one thought or mental image, inhibiting all other thoughts until the senses are entirely stilled. Then say as before, my subliminal mind draws upon the all wisdom and solves my every problem. And of part four. All right, on your way to the next video, please hit that like button, leave me a comment, let me know you were here, and if you like what you see and hear on this channel, subscribe and share it with your friends.